Hello, I'm John David Ebert, and uh, this is my show. Um, what I thought I would do is take the trouble to uh, sort of sit down uh, and go back over my books, do a kind of uh, electronic uh, curriculum vitae, um, and go back through my books and sort of reacquaint myself uh, with the public. And uh, in case anybody's wondering who I am and what I've written, and so forth, uh, Professor Henry Warwick at, uh, out in Toronto has agreed to restore my uh, Wikipedia page. Uh, and once that's up, it'll have a complete bibliography, and you'll see I've written 25 books at this point, uh, and uh, I've got 57 albums on Google Play with various lectures on Heidegger and Deleuze and Guattari and uh, Marshall McLuhan and all, all those guys on there, as well as hundreds of videos on YouTube uh, discussing the works of great philosophers and contemporary thinkers and so forth from Oswald Spengler down to Alain Badiou. Um, I started out as an editor uh, for the Joseph Campbell Foundation. Uh, they hired me back in 1995, right out of college. Um, I graduated from Arizona State University uh, with a degree in English in uh, 1990, I believe it was. And then in 95, the Joseph Campbell Foundation hired me uh, after I sent them a letter asking about uh, the fate of Campbell's uh, posthumous books. And they said that uh, they'd be happy to have me work on uh, editing his and writing footnotes for his posthumous books. So this was the first one I worked on, uh, Bakshis and Brahman, Campbell's uh, diaries from his travels in India in 1954-55. I wrote footnotes for that. And the publisher at that time was still HarperCollins. Note this, because the publishing industry uh, was shifting right about the time that I was coming into the picture it was starting to shift and lose interest in thinkers like Campbell. Uh, and they only did one other book with uh, the Joseph Campbell Foundation that I also worked on, The Mythic Dimension, Selected Essays. I wrote all the footnotes in this. And uh, then they lost their contract with HarperCollins because these books weren't selling. And it was at this time, although unbeknownst to me, that the publishing industry was losing interest in publishing the works of public intellectuals like Lewis Mumford, Marshall McLuhan, Joseph Campbell, those men uh, could no longer be published by the New York uh, publishing world. Uh, the internet was coming along about that time and it was slowly, subtly starting to impact the society and to create hypermodernity, which is, I've written an essay about on my blog, it's gotten a fair bit of attention. After I left the Campbell Foundation in the late 90s, I became interested, uh, I was still kind of new agey. Uh, I, I was looking for a worldview uh, I had and have always had a spiritual orientation. Uh, I'm not Christian, and uh, because of the spiritual orientation, I'm, I have no interest in Marxism. So I've never been interested in, in Marx or uh, Christianity or any kind of organized religion, but I've always been spiritual. So uh, I set out to interview these New Agey thinkers in my first book, Twilight of the Clockwork God, which was published in 1999 by Council Oak Books, a small uh, press out in San Francisco. They put it out a nice, handsome, attractive, hardback volume of interviews with people like uh, William Irwin Thompson and Stanislav Grof. Terence McKenna was one of the last people to interview Terence McKenna before he died. And Lynn Margulis, uh, who is now, she was the co-architect with James Lovelock of the Gaia hypothesis. And her theory about uh, symbiosis and cellular evolution has since become standard textbook uh, material now. Uh, but it wasn't back then when I interviewed her. It was in the process of becoming that and uh, Rupert Sheldrake about morphogenetic fields and all that kind of thing. So I was at the, this is all apprentice work. Uh, at this point, I was still seeking. I, I was questing, uh, working on trying to find a worldview. Um, so then I shifted, because I've had such a big interest in film all my life, I decided to apply what I learned about comparative mythology and uh, media studies from studying some Marshall McLuhan to apply those kinds of techniques to an analysis of contemporary cinema since 1968. And so my second book, Celluloid Heroes and Mechanical Dragons, uh, is a collection of essays about the mythic implications of film, especially films like 2001 A Space Odyssey or the Star Wars films, films of that nature that deal with myths about technology uh, and particularly with the idea of technology as a threat to the human psyche and how the human psyche responds to that. I had a New York agent at the time, and they shopped it around for a year and could not find a publisher. Again, 
uh, the publishing industry was changing. So I wound up with an obscure New Zealand publisher called Cyber Editions, who put this out in a very unattractive paperback, and it's not been reprinted since. But my third book, um, I shifted my interest to the field of celebrities, and I became fascinated with this idea of the syndrome of fame. Uh, I started thinking about Elvis Presley and Marilyn Monroe and James Dean, wondering why they were so famous. Daniel Borstein, in his book, The Image, has an essay on celebrity, where he says that the celebrity uh, is something that uh, is a kind of pseudo event. It's a non event and celebrities don't last. The next generation doesn't remember who the previous generation's celebrities were. Ask your parents who Jack Benny was and they'll remember. You're not going to have any clue who Jack Benny was or uh, Howard Hughes or any of those people, but you will know Elvis Presley, James Dean, John F. Kennedy, Marilyn Monroe, these, these celebrities attain to a kind of timelessness. They're sort of like at the level of uh, saints in the age of electronic stained glass. And so I approached them uh, with that sensibility uh, and wrote my third book, Dead Celebrities, Living Icons, Tragedy and Fame in the Age of the Multimedia Superstar. Um, and this book was published in a hardback by Prager, uh, a good, very old New York publisher who had published all these philosophy books back in the 60s and 70s. It was a good good publisher to have for that. Um, it was one of my favorite books to write and, and oddly has sold the, probably the fewest copies of all of my books. Uh, but I was moving now into French theory. Uh, for that book, I had discovered Baudrillard. I knew that Baudrillard would have something interesting to say, so I read, read through all his books and all of Paul Virilio's books. That opened the door for me now to French theory. So I began to move out of the field of comparative mythology and media studies and into the field of contemporary theory, starting with those two theoreticians uh, and Walter Benjamin, uh, also uh, and Roland Bart. Um, I began reading these men and I applied them and their ideas in that book. Uh, by the time I came to my next book, uh, this was The New Media Invasion, uh, which was published in 2011, which I wrote uh, up in Boulder, Colorado when I was living there. and. Uh, one day I just woke up with the idea in mind, gee, I wonder what Marshall McLuhan would have said about Facebook. Um, it's too bad we didn't still have him around. And I thought, I wonder what he would say about the Internet as a whole or Amazon. He would have something interesting to say about all of this. And I thought, well, uh, let's see what I can do with it. So I sat down. I read back through McLuhan, uh, Neil Postman, and all these kinds of guys, more French theory I started bringing in. And so uh, I published this with a small press. Uh, McFarland books. Uh, they're in London and they're a small press. They put it out in paperback um, and it is one of my most popular books. It has been taught in a couple of college classrooms and I went through and analyzed uh, the impact of the internet starting in 1995. What I was doing and didn't know that I was doing was actually uh, elucidating the architecture of hypermodernity which in the blog essay that I've just written, uh, I've portrayed as something that happened right about 1995 when the National Science Foundation turned the internet over to the public and everything began plugging and jacking into the internet. Retail space disappeared, record stores, movie theaters, uh, bookstores began to disappear, shopping malls became vacant in the early 2000s. That was hypermodernity. I didn't realize I was writing about it, uh, but that's what was going on. And then I followed that in 2012 with another book, uh, The Age of Catastrophe, published by the same publisher, McFarland Books, A Disaster in Humanity in Modern Times. And I got the idea from this book from reading Paul Virilio. Virilio always had something interesting to say about accidents and catastrophes, his theory of dromology, and what happens when you uh, enter into the dromosphere, which uh, you enter into the moment your feet leave the ground in a wheeled conveyance or on the back of a donkey, uh, whatever. It accelerates over time and accidents get worse and worse. The larger the acceleration, the bigger the resulting accident is going to be. Uh, but he didn't talk about the specific details of any of these accidents, like the sinking of the Titanic or the blowing up of the Hindenburg or all, all the way down to uh, the, oil, the great oil spills and uh, the Chinese earthquake of 2008. So I went into all of those accidents and catastrophes and, and I found a pattern there where they are indeed getting larger and larger with time until with the incidents like Hurricane Katrina and the uh, oil spill, they, they, Fukushima, they begin to take on planetary scale dimensions that they never had before. They were local before. The sinking of the Titanic was a local event, 
with uh, consequences that were limited to a particular time and geographic space. Same thing with the Hindenburg. Uh, but once you start moving into stuff like Bhopal uh, and start moving into the bigger accidents uh, that have consequences that ramify, I got all, all this from studying Ulrich Beck and Zygmunt Bauman. Ulrich Beck especially uh, is a German sociologist, very good at uh, elucidating this kind of accidentology. Now that was the last book. These are uh, these first five books were all published with traditional publishers. I wasn't making any money from them. Uh, the contracts are not good, as everyone knows. You get ten percent. Uh, the publisher pockets the other ninety percent. Um, it's not a good deal for writers, and it's very difficult to make a living. And at this point, I was beginning to experiment with new media. In 2012, I started uh, uploading YouTube videos, uh, just discussing philosophers. I was having a hard time understanding Heidegger at the time. And when I finally broke through and figured him out, I thought, gee, it would have been great if when I was reading Heidegger, I could have gone to YouTube and pulled up videos uh, of people explaining and getting right to the point, explaining uh, Heidegger and his ideas about being and so forth. And once I understood it, I decided to start uploading videos that I thought would be helpful for other people uh, trying to understand Heidegger or Oswald Spengler or Deleuze and Guattari. So I started worming my way through all those uh, in 2013, 2012 and 2013, uploading these videos and lectures. Nobody else was doing this at the time, by the way. Uh, now you go on there, there's scores of people doing this very thing, but I was one of the, the first to do this. Uh, but I decided at the same time uh, to experiment with the new media. I'd written about the new media and the new media invasion where I saw it as a threat, liquidating the Gutenbergian analog media and digitizing everything. Uh, but new media possibilities were opening up. Amazon uh, had a new self-publishing wing called CreateSpace. And I thought, uh, well, gee, if Amazon is sponsoring this, it must be you know, stable, something worth trying. Uh, so I self-published my first book, uh, first self-published book, Art After Metaphysics, uh, the cover art is, is comes from the excellent UK artist Chris Boyd, uh, is one of my friends, and he graciously agreed to allow me to use this work of art uh, for the cover. And I self-published this. Uh, it was a little bit on the expensive side until I realized that uh, once you mastered InDesign, you could upload the files yourself and do it all for free, which is what I started doing after this. Um, this book is still very popular. It's one of my most popular books. It's still being taught in college classrooms. People like it quite a bit, especially the introduction, which is a compressed miniature history of uh, all the iconotypes of Western art and the transformations that they go through over time, beginning with the Christian iconotypes, moving through the Dutch iconotypes in the 17th century of infinite space and the new world picture with still lifes and portrait studies replacing the saints and uh, repeated obsessive iconotypes like the crucifixion that gradually go down the drain. And then with the Impressionists, they come along and get rid of all narratives whatsoever. And the city and the sensory impressions become this shallow surface level world that dematerializes and melts down three-dimensional space and it becomes aperspectival, as Gene Gebser called it uh, brilliantly in his book, Ever Present Origin, aperspectival space introduced uh, with Paris as the capital of all this in the late 19th century with the first generation of Impressionists. Manet is the pioneer here. He is the first to begin to dismantle perspective in painting. And so I chronicled all of that in the introduction and then went through uh, and analyzed the main uh, structuring features in the evolution of the works of artists like Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, all the way down to Damien Hirst and Anish Kapoor and Anselm Kiefer. Then I gathered up, uh, over the years, I'd had a website called cinemadiscourse.com where I'd been putting my little film reviews, uh, more erudite and intelligent than the average review, more like miniature film essays, and I'd been piling them up over the years in uh, on my website, and I noticed uh, that electronic technology uh, is inherently unstable. I would go back and look at the essays, and they would be corrupted with mysterious characters that would just over time like there's a sort of electronic decay rate where these characters just creep in and I started to realize that uh, if I just left these in electronic form one day they might just cease to exist altogether and there would be no record of them so I gathered them all up and self-published them with my next book on create space called uh, post-classic cinema with a wonderful uh, cover for uh, photograph by the artist Rose Marsicano who was gracious enough to allow me to use her image for the cover excellent artist. Look her up. She's a very beautiful photographer. Um, so those are all my film reviews. 
uh, discussing what I term, and so far as I know, I was the first to do this, the term, uh, the development in cinema uh, that was going on in hypermodernity right around the 99, 2000, uh, as post-classic. Uh, I think it's pretty evident that, that film is in a late stage of decadence. Uh, it's not what it used to be. It's certainly not what it was in the 70s and the 80s with great film directors like David Cronenberg, who's given up. He's actually retired and simply announced that he's, he's quit. And uh, Stanley Kubrick and Steven Spielberg and so forth. Uh, those days are all gone, and the films that we're getting now are not very interesting. The cable television shows are wonderful, but and the uh, Netflix shows and so forth, but film is, uh, is not, in a, it's, it's not in a good state. Uh, curious about all the new media, so I decided to sit down and explore the medium of graphic novels. Another medium, uh, which uh, people don't seem to take seriously, when new media come along, uh, as, let's say, the novel did for the Greeks. When the Greek novel came about in the first couple of centuries AD, uh, it was regarded with scorn as a, like film, as a merely popular amusement, a circus form of media. Uh, but it was inventing a new genre entirely that the intelligentsia were missing, the novel, uh, coming in to replace the epic, which was dying out in precisely those first few centuries AD with the last few great Roman epic writers, Silius, uh, who writes an epic based on the Punic War, and uh, Statius, whose uh, wonderful debate is about a retelling of the Seven Against Thebes, and uh, all those guys, Lucan's Pharsalia, and so forth. The novel came in to replace that. So I took a look at graphic novels, and I wrote this book, Giant Humans, Tiny Worlds, with cover art uh, by the artist Valerie Marino, uh, who was kind enough to allow me to use her image for the cover. And I went through and took, uh, I looked at all the lists that kept coming up for the best and most popular graphic novels, uh, everything from three, Frank Miller's 300 uh, down through uh, The Walking Dead, uh, Sin City, Dark Knight Returns by Frank Miller, um, The Sandman, wonderful, Neil Gaiman's uh, Sandman, uh, all this great stuff, Watchmen. I sat down and read through all of it <clears throat> and wrote essays on each one of them. And so, for what they're worth, my reflections on the incipient, nascent medium of the graphic novel are to be found in here, whereas here we have essays on a, on a medium that is vanishing and is debilitating and disappearing. So we've got, we're in the age where film is disappearing, the graphic novel is coming in, uh, as well as the television show and so forth, just as in the Hellenistic and Roman period, we had the dying epic and the newborn novel, a uh, Greek novel coming in uh, to replace them. Uh, so then I published, I self-published a book that I had started. I'd gotten another New York agent, uh, and he tried shopping around an idea I had for going back to the origins of Western monotheism uh, and examining those origins, and then I was going to go and look at science and examine the origins of science with uh, in the 17th century with Newton and then look at Darwin and so forth, and I was going to sort of compare the two worlds. And I got about halfway through the book, I wrote uh, essays on Gilgamesh, Akhenaten, and Moses. So the book is called Rage and the Word, uh, Gilgamesh, Akhenaten, Moses, and the Birth of the Metaphysical Age. Uh, it's, a, it's a torso. Um, and so aptly, I put a torso of Akhenaten, uh, an archaic torso of Akhenaten on the cover. Uh, it's a torso. It's unfinished. But I think what's there is pretty strong. These are some of my best essays, actually. They're pretty well written. Um, I spent many years researching Mesopotamian history, I know it very well, and I uh, went back through that to examine uh, Akhenaten as uh, the kind of rage that you find with Achilles uh, in the Iliad uh, actually goes back to the zeal and fanaticism of Akhenaten. He's already sort of announcing he's the first zealot in Western history um, who goes around uh, inscribing, wiping out and erasing, deconstructing all the funereal cults and putting in their place the sun cult. So that the underworld drops out and gets forgotten about uh, and anathematized in Akhenaten's revolution. Uh, and then we've got the story of Gilgamesh, where I figured out that the Gilgamesh epic is about a journey through the Zodiac. Um, and I figured this out. Um, I talked to some Journal of Near Eastern Study guys who uh, poo-pooed this and said, no, the, the Mesopotamians could not have known astrology any earlier than the Mullapan tablets from 1000 BC, um, that they make the mistake there, and it's a big one, of assuming that a written medium represents the beginning of the appearance of something, when in most cases it represents actually the end of a tradition, 
uh, as with the pyramid texts, for instance. The pyramid texts were inscribed on the walls of pyramids, um, <clears throat> starting uh, with the fifth dynasty, uh, the period of Unus, but before that, they hadn't been inscribed at all because they were orally recited. Uh, so it became very clear that the reason they were inscribed in the fifth dynasty pyramid of Unus was because they were being forgotten. They were in danger of disappearing. So by the time a tradition is committed to writing, and this goes for the Sumerian myths as well, uh, from the great period uh, of the Sumerian restoration with the third dynasty of Ur, uh, where the Sumerian myths start appearing, because they're, they're disappearing. Uh, something appears in writing when it's about to disappear. Uh, the Homeric epics are probably another example of this. They were probably, the bards probably weren't learning them, uh, and then so they were written down and preserved. Same thing with the Mullapin tablets. We can already presuppose that they were committed to writing because they were losing the knowledge, and the tradition probably goes back thousands of years earlier. So trust me on that. Gilgamesh is about a journey through the zodiac, just as the 12 labors of Heracles are. Uh, I went back and picked up and finished a book that I had started back in 2006 that splintered off to become dead celebrities, living icons, and I was working on a kind of uh, archaeological prequel to Celluloid Heroes Mechanical Dragons called Gods and Heroes of the Media Age from Captain Nemo to the X-Files. Or I, I was examining the origins of figures like Tarzan and Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers and uh, The Shadow and uh, James Bond, characters like that uh, that came out of Pulp Fiction. Uh, and I got to Elvis Presley and I thought there should be a chapter on Elvis Presley in there. That splintered off into Dead Celebrities Living Icons. And so uh, I went back to this book, I think it was 2015, and finished it and published it. Um, one of my least popular, but for some reason nobody, nobody pays it any attention, but I had a good time writing it. Um, so we have some more uh, books um, uh, gathered up. Uh, over the years, I had quite a few customer reviews on Amazon that I wrote, uh, quite, quite a few of them. I went back and polished them up uh, and made them presentable for the public and gathered some, all of them together in this book. Texts, collected book reviews from Joseph Campbell to Deleuze and Guattari, kind of a hidden uh, intellectual autobiography, um, but it's got all my Amazon reviews in it. And then uh, I became curious one night while watching Apocalypse Now uh, that it might be interesting to sit down and go through it, the DVD, and go through it chapter by chapter as it were, and do a sort of chapter-by-chapter chapter commentary the way scholars do for, the, let's say, the Iliad or the Odyssey or the Argonautica or what have you. So I sat down and I went through uh, with the DVD, Apocalypse Now, scene by scene, uh, and I invented this little genre of books. Uh, I wrote six of them, scene-by-scene scene books. They're actually, uh, most people don't pay them much attention who are interested in the big ideas of my earlier books, but these are these are my best sellers, the scene-by-scene the, the scene books. Uh, they're popular in college classrooms, I think. Professors like them, and uh, they're, they're among my most popular books, even though uh, they don't tend to be associated with the crowd that likes my four most popular books being Art After Metaphysics, um, New Media Invasion, Dead Celebrities, uh, or most important, that one's not as popular as it probably should have been, and uh, Age of Catastrophe. So Apocalypse Now, scene-by-scene, scene, more create space uh, fun. And uh, followed that with Star Wars, scene by scene. Not a film really that, uh, it's fairly obvious, it doesn't need much elucidation or exploration, and that's probably why it's the least popular of my scene by scene books. Nonetheless, uh, from the point of view of a scholar of mythology, there's quite a lot going on in Star Wars that is not necessarily so evident when you dig into it and begin thinking about its architecture and its structure. Um, for example, the film is divided into two halves, where you have two orbs, uh, the world of Tatooine, and then the world of the Death Star, an artificial orb. Um, one is descended from the Dune novels of Frank Herbert, the other from uh, the city uh, in the Foundation novels of Isaac Asimov of Trantor. Lucas has sort of taken those two worldscapes and rubbed them up against each other to see the friction that they generate uh, creates the myth. And of course, after having read uh, Lucas had read, of course, uh, Joseph Campbell uh, and applied the Hero of a Thousand Faces uh, and got the basic structure for it. Okay, so there's that. And then I moved on to The Shining, scene by scene, uh, which is one of my all-time favorite films, a marvelous, a ma epic masterpiece. Uh, not a good novel by Stephen King, but a great 
great film, one of the greatest ever made. And Ridley Scott's uh, Alien, uh, uh, the cover art on the scene by scenes, starting with Star Wars, was done by a gentleman named uh, Lawrence Philip Pierce, who uh, lives in Los Angeles, and he was kind enough to do the cover art illustrations for these, since the, the actual stills from the movies would be too expensive copyright-wise for me to use. So these, these are his illustrations on these covers for the scene-by-scene -scene books, and then Blade Runner scene-by-scene -scene, um, has been selling very well, naturally, with the uh, Blade Runner sequel coming out. Um, and then the last of the series was Videodrome scene-by-scene, -scene, and that was that. Then I went back and I gathered up uh, some essays that had been lying around uh, uh, decaying in electronic orbit in the decay space of uh, my laptop, and I pulled those out and gathered them up in a little collection called Myths, Gods, Machines, Illuminations on uh, Mythology, History, and Science that looks, uh, sort of takes essays from all over my career. It reads kind of like a John David Ebert reader. Um, it's a good introduction to my work. There's some stuff from my myth studies period, my media studies period, my critical theory period, and so forth. And then um, that was the, uh, the main collection of books that I wrote as far as theory went. And then I shifted into a creative mode uh, in 2017 and wrote this book, Archai, a cosmogonic poem, uh, which is a, po a poetic transformation of the history of the earth, starting with the Hadean and Archean epochs and working on down through those, down through each of the epochs. Uh, and the poetry, as I look back over, poetry has a funny habit of when you first write it, you think, oh, that's great, that's good stuff. Then you look at it two years later and you realize it was total crap. Um, but this is looking pretty good. I, been looking at these poems, and I think they're holding up pretty well. It's not bad poetry. Um, I wrote a novel about Gilgamesh um, in poetic style. Uh, it's my favorite epic, my favorite work of literature, and I think the problem with it is getting a good readable version. It's always broken up with all these tablets with missing pieces and so forth. So I just kept totally faithful to the epic and retold it, smoothed it out, gave it a nice streamlined narrative form uh, and put it out as a, as a novel. And then uh, another poetry cycle, Orpheus in the World Interior, uh, about uh, the world interior of capital and what's going on with that, and uh, a poetic history of the dead, uh, where I transformed uh, my work on the history of the afterlife and archaeological grave sites and burials into poetry. And then uh, that's it. And then uh, those are my books uh, so far. And so that gives you a kind of introduction to John David Ebert. And all those books are in print and available on Amazon. You can go onto Amazon and buy any of them. And then, as I say, I have 57 lectures on uh, Google Play. Just type in my name on Google Play, any of which are convertible to iTunes. And my website is culturaldiscourse.com. And I also have one, cinemadiscourse.com. And uh, thank you.